Hi, and welcome back to The Ville. This is video from The Ville, and I'm uh, Charlie Greenewalt. Uh, this is Dr. Greenewalt uh, trying to pick up uh, where we left off in our last class of uh, Congress, Congress and lawmaking. Uh, last time on Congress and lawmaking, we were talking about presidential congressional relationships, and this is what I'd like to pick up where we left off and finish uh, this section. I'd like you, through these video uh, presentations, to go ahead and either have another video device by you so that you can refer to the PowerPoints as we uh, proceed, or go ahead and run the PowerPoints off um, as handouts and have them by your side while you view this so you can see what I'm referring to. That would be, that would be great. If any of you have questions, be sure to email them to me, and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. And of course, um, if uh, the questions are very um, difficult to deal with by email, we'll, be, um, we'll certainly uh, uh, be able to set up a telephone conversation. Okay? All right. Well, last time we left off on presidential congressional relationships, and we were going to talk about the future of congressional presidential relationships. Uh, what is the uh, possibility, the opportunity um, to create a new partnership between uh, any president of the United States and any Congress that is serving at the time? And we find that, as many observers would tell us, that this is only possible to create a um, well-functioning relationship between these two branches of government if they share common expectations of one another. If they share common expectations about what each one can do well. If Congress tries to do the work of the president or the president tries to do the work of the Congress, both branches will fail. But both branches' efforts to conduct an all-governing um, all governing activities have resulted in expanded technical, uh, expanded technical staff that now threatens to overshadow and perhaps overwhelm the members of Congress and the President. Congressional staff increases have certainly made Congress better able to serve constituents, but not better able to find the bases for compromise with the President. In order to have a successful presidential congressional relationship, what we need to have is a change of attitudes, not further organizational reform. We have to have a reestablishment of trust and a reestablishment of respect between these two branches in order to achieve um, better presidential congressional relationships and have the best relationship that we can. Let's go ahead and look at two case studies of strained relationships between the Congress and between the President. And from your um, PowerPoints and from your handouts, you can see that the two case studies I've chosen uh, to discuss with you uh, this semester uh, would be the Nixon White House and the uh, Carter White House. Let's take a look at these two case studies. Let's start with the Nixon presidency. We find that the Nixon presidency, of course, is well known for its friction with Congress uh, during his second term, but there are many other presidents that have uh, manifested the same type of conflict. We've seen the same type of conflict in the presidencies of, um, for example, John Quincy Adams due to the contested uh, presidential election of 1824. Uh, Andrew Johnson, and of course, uh, his treatment of the southern states after the assassination of uh, President Lincoln and his ascension to the presidency. Uh, we had friction in the presidencies of Warren Harding, for example, Harry Truman. Uh, we find friction as well, of course, during the presidencies of President Clinton, uh, President Obama, and President Trump as well. But the Nixon presidency was a very strong presidency in terms of setting goals and achieving goals. 
the foundation of Nixon's philosophy on presidential congressional relations was that the president believed that his accountability uh, flowed directly to the electorate. He believed that he had to um, answer uh, to them. Uh, you find at the presidential election, particularly in 1968 he won, but in 1972 he overwhelmingly uh, won re-election uh, with um, every state except Massachusetts and the District of Columbia voting for him. Uh, but uh, he believed that the election, particularly in 1972, conferred a mandate on him, an entitlement to act in all ways, large and small, as his, as his predecessors had acted in office before him. He saw himself almost as a lone Republican uh, with a Democratic Congress and a New Deal bureaucracy. So he believed he was in a struggle against almost overwhelming odds. He also believed that his election conferred a degree of illegitimacy on the New Deal bureaucracy on the New Deal bureaucracy, on interest group leaders, on national journalists, on congressmen and party leaders uh, that were um, found in uh, official Washington, D.C. Uh, what um, we refer to, what many people refer to today as the deep state. President Nixon believed that this elite group was out of step with the rest of the country particularly the dominant conservative mood of the country. Ralph Hewitt, and of course there's a PowerPoint for this uh, item, Ralph Hewitt uh, establishes, uh, creates a very good analogy. Uh, he believes that a successful presidential congressional relationship is just like a successful marriage. And I tried to find some successful marriages that I portrayed at the bottom of my PowerPoint slide. Uh, I don't know if you think uh, Fred and Wilma had a, a good marriage, and uh, who is the family in the middle? Of course, that is the, uh, the Cleaver family from Leave it to Beaver, and of course the family all the way on the right is that Dagwood and Blondie. Um, but uh, we have what Hewitt says, uh, only a successful presidential congressional relationship uh, as you would have a successful marriage. In a successful marriage, both parties want the relationship to succeed. Both parties agree to arrangements which are workable uh, so they can do their day-to-day -day business uh, without confrontation about minor day-to-day uh, -day chores and day-to-day -day things. So that is something that uh, we need to have a successful marriage something that we need to have a successful relationship between the President and the Congress. You find that President Nixon increasingly began to question the legitimacy of the Congress, and therefore he started to encroach upon the turf of the Congress. He started to run the country without the Congress. And you find that this was perhaps made easier uh, by President Nixon's priorities. President Nixon's priorities were found in foreign policy and in streamlining domestic programs. Uh, so he could, uh, was able to enact many measures uh, without the uh, assistance or the need for Congress to step in. How did Congress react to President Nixon encroaching upon his turf? Well, they encroached, they encroached upon his turf. You find that there are three roles for Congress in the policy process. What are those three roles for the Congress? Congress can be an initiator of comprehensive policies. Congress can be a reserve partner. Or Congress can be a facilitator of interests. You find that if we're going to look at these roles, an initiator of comprehensive roles is one in which Congress seeks to govern by itself. So Congress seeks to govern alone. Many observers would tell you that this is the most pretentious role that Congress could seek out, since it is founded on the belief that Congress is able to define problems, set priorities, identify options, and analyze effects. Um, 
They're more able so to do so today than they were in the 1960s and 70s uh, due to congressional reform and staff increases, but that's still quite a stretch uh, to believe that Congress will be able to do those things. A reserve partner. In the role of reserve partner, Congress acknowledges presidential leadership in policy formulation. They simply provide the support and the backing. As a facilitator of interests, we find that Congress uh, would try to be certain to express uh, all societal viewpoints, that no societal viewpoint would go um, unrepresented in the Congress. Well, how does Congress conventionally behave? Usually we find that congressional behavior and congressional organization is characterized by some combination of these three roles. Um, however, at any one point in time, there may be one role that predominates over the other. The role that has traditionally, the roles, roles that have traditionally dominated have been those of facilitator of interests and reserve partners. President Nixon's challenge convinced Congress that they should assume the role of initiator of comprehensive policies. Well, Congress as an initiator of comprehensive policies, um, we find that Congress, in order to pursue that role, uh, knew they needed substantial reform. Substantial reform was necessary for them to augment, to acquire the full capabilities that would be necessary for comprehensive policy initiation. And we find that that takes us into three distinct phases of the reform decade of the 1970s that can be identified. The first phase of the reform decade of the 1970s was phase one is before the Nixon challenge. Before the Nixon challenge, we find that Congress passed the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1970. We've touched on this before and I can't uh, emphasize the importance of it enough. Um, the Legislative Re Reorganization Act of 1970. This act, in fact, provided numerous significant reforms. What did it do? Well, number one, it required that teller votes on the floor be recorded. Prior to this time, teller votes had been tabulated in total, and no individual members' votes were tallied, none were recorded. The members employed the teller method to elude accountability. This reform put voting in the House on par with voting in the Senate, where teller votes did not exist, and all important floor votes are recorded by individual name of the congressman and the senator. Secondly, we find that the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1970 required the committees to have written rules. Now, for the first time, committees have to have written rules, and this can serve as an important check on the arbitrary use of power by committee chairmen. Number three, uh, the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1970 made all roll call votes taken in closed committee sessions public knowledge. This again is a step towards holding uh, members much more accountable for their actions in committee as well as on the floor of the House. You notice I apologize in number three, roll is misspelled. It's R-O-L-L, -L, of course, not R-O-L-E. Number four, Legislative Reorganization Act of 1970 allowed a committee majority to call a committee meeting even though the chairman didn't do so uh, upon request. Number five, the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1970 guaranteed that a majority of minority members of the committee would be allowed to call their own witnesses for hearings in the House of Representatives. Number six, and finally, number six, the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1970 altered the rules that govern committee assignments so that senators could only be members of two major committees and one minor committee. 
So now senators, we could only be members of two major committees and one minor committee. No House member was allowed to chair more than one committee as well. And this was based on a 1971 Democratic House caucus ruling. Okay, well, those are very important changes uh, that you should uh, remember. Well, the second phase of the um, reform decade of the 1970s and this response that Congress uh, made to the challenge by the Nixon administration, uh, phase two is entitled Response to the Nixon Challenge. We find that this group of reforms was the most extensive and was directly related to the challenge that President Nixon had made to both the legitimacy and the competency of the Congress. And these reforms all followed the 1972 presidential election. What were they? Well, first of all, these reforms were the War Powers Act of 1973, which you've heard me say many times, is nothing more than a legislative veto. And the Supreme Court has ruled many, many uh, eons ago that legislative vetoes are unconstitutional. Yet, as I emphasized before, both the president, uh, all presidents, and all congresses have not been willing to take this case to the Supreme Court and challenge the constitutionality of the War Powers Act of 1973 because they simply don't know how the court might rule at any time on anything. So both uh, the Congress and the president have been able to make uh, tolerable accommodations with one another on the issue of troop levels, troop commitments, uh, and foreign uh, entanglements abroad. The second response uh, under phase two to the Nixon challenge uh, was the Budget and Impoundment Control Act of 1973, uh, which tried to control and eliminate the power of the president to impound funds uh, in the uh, uh, executive budget. Thirdly, the expansion of congressional staff. We see that congressional staff eventually expands fivefold um, by the time that the reform decade is over. Well, phase three of the reform decade is post Watergate. Post Watergate. This last set of reforms came from a desire for campaign finance reform and a enhanced focus, a greater focus on ethics uh, in government following the resignation of President Nixon. What were the elements of the third phase? The elements of the post-Watergate phase were number one, the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1974, which providing um, federal funding for presidential elections uh, if candidates chose to uh, accept it. So we find that the first element of this phase three, the post-Watergate era, was the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1974. Number two, we had a new ethics code that was adopted. Number three, we continued to see a streamlining of committee systems in the House and the Senate. And number four, greater demands for sunset legislation. Greater demands for sunset legislation. Now, Charlie Jones, oh, by the way, uh, of course, sunset legislation is legislation that simply uh, says that um, Congress must uh, reauthorize a executive agency uh, to continue to exist. If that authorization is not forthcoming, uh, it would disband. Well, we find that Charlie Jones has his own opinion of Congress assuming the initiator role. We find that Charlie Jones, when he was at uh, the um, he was at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, and then he came to the University of Virginia. But Charlie Jones believes that uh, the initiator role for Congress is pretentious; it's overly ambitious. He believes that a legislature may not be able to know where to stop when it is 
trying to imitate the executive branch. The form, we found that, in fact, former Senator Edmund Muskie from Maine, former presidential candidate, um, and uh, uh, leading uh, politician uh, in the United States during the 1960s and 70s, former Senator Muskie warned against pursuing the initiator role due to the fragmented and representative nature of the Congress. So if we were to summarize the presidential congressional relationship um, that we find under the Nixon administration, we find that Nixon challenged both the legitimacy and the competency of the Congress. And that encouraged him to expand uh, his policy organization and activities. Congress did the same thing. When Nixon resigned from the presidency, we find that Gerald Ford, President Ford, uh, uh, assumed office, and his legitimacy was directly tied to a majority vote in each chamber of the Congress. So that was a further encouragement for Congress uh, to uh, grow uh, and for their own uh, ambition, because they knew that Jerry Ford had been the leader of the minority in the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, and his only uh, legitimacy uh, for the President of the United States was when President Nixon uh, recommended him uh, to be the Vice President, that both chambers of the, of the Congress had to vote for him. That is where uh, Jerry Ford's accountability uh, derives from, and his legitimacy. Now, when Jimmy Carter arrives in Washington in 1977, he found a Congress that had fundamentally altered expectations about themselves and about the presidency. Let's take a look at the Carter presidency. The Carter presidency is summarized very well by Samuel Patterson of the American Enterprise uh, Institute. Um, and I don't expect you to memorize this quotation, but I wanted you to see it. I wanted you to have a feeling for the uh, setting and for the mood of the times. Uh, Samuel Patterson tells us that, quote, Congress has great political power and enormous capacity to frustrate the legislative ambitions of the president. It tasted sovereignty during the exhilarating days of 1973 when it nearly removed the president from office. Of course, it eventually does. Congress is far more formidable as a political body today than it was in the more quiescent days of the 1950s and early 1960s. Congress is semi-sovereign, and that is the point. Congress is semi-sovereign. Well, if we are going to look at the uh, second um, example, the second case study, uh, is the uh, relationship that existed between uh, the, the administration of President Jimmy Carter, a uh, Democrat from Georgia, and the Congress of the United States. We find the five factors that served as sources of cooperation between the Congress and between the President, they were all in place when Jimmy Carter came into the presidency. Unquestionably, you could have had a strong new partnership that could have been forged between the new president and the 95th Congress. We find that the Democratic leaders in Congress, Tip O'Neill, uh, who was Speaker of the House, um, a Democrat from Massachusetts, and Robert Byrd, the Majority Leader of the Senate, a Democrat from West Virginia, they were eager, eager uh, to cooperate with the president. But what was the relationship? Well, President Carter had it within his power to make the two congressional leaders look very, very good. He could have made them look good uh, through an um, extensive process of consultation. He could have provided them favors. He should have supported them in dealings with their members. And he could have relied upon them as a great source of information uh, about the um, interests of Congress and the mood of the Congress. We find the congressional leaders' effectiveness with the House and with the Senate Democrats was important to the success of the 
president's program. They needed the rank and file to support them, and the congressional leadership could have provided this. But instead of making the congressional leadership look good, you find President Carter almost went out of his way to make the congressional leadership look bad. First of all, President Carter uh, pushed zealously for the reduction of water projects. The water projects were important to what part of the country? Primarily the far west. And therefore, all the Democrats in the far west who wanted water projects or had them and they needed to be maintained with federal funding, we find that um, his idea of reducing water projects, for whatever reason, did not go over well there. President Carter, as well, ignored uh, senatorial courtesy when he wanted to appoint uh, a member uh, to a executive bureau or department. Uh, he did so, and it didn't matter if um, that uh, individual belonged to the same party as the U.S. Uh, senators did from that from his home state. Uh, he declined to use senatorial courtesy. Number three, President Carter, Carter formulated an entire national energy policy. And he brought together this national energy policy with absolutely no consultation with the Congress, no consultation with congressional leaders. And the interesting thing is, and I remember watching it, he went live in a national speech and he announced his national energy plan to the country. And the congressional leaders found out about it at the same time as I did and all other Americans. Carter uh, frequently also would alter his legislative proposals. Sometimes he would drop them all together after the leaders had committed themselves to those programs and committed their resources to the enactment of those proposals on behalf of the president. One of the best examples is the idea that President Carter had that he was going to uh, provide a $50 income tax rebate for everyone in the country. We find that um, Senator Byrd and Representative or Speaker O'Neill um, owed President Carter no particular allegiance, uh, no particular loyalty. Um, they um, were willing to go along with this program uh, if the president wanted it, and once they committed to it, he dropped the idea. It's amazing that they remained as outwardly loyal to him as they did. Well, what was the summary that we can therefore uh, come up with uh, to portray the relationship between President Carter uh, and the Congress? Um, there are many people who would, many observers, would simply say the occupant of the White House was an intelligent and socially aware Democrat without any Washington experience and without any apparent interest in obtaining any. Congress had able but untested leadership. They simply were seeking to consolidate a large number of internal reforms that Congress had made to democratize themselves. So therefore, one saw a dependent president demonstrating artless policy behavior facing an independent Congress that was anxious to assume an overly ambitious role of policy making. So that's where we were. Uh, we find that these two case studies, uh, the presidential congressional uh, evaluations of one another for these two case studies. Um, we find in the Carter case study that Congress and the President, they didn't question the institutional legitimacy of one another, but they did question one another's competency. Um, Senator Byrd and Speaker O'Neill uh, did begin to question uh, the competency of President Carter and of his administration. And likewise, he questioned their competencies as leaders of the Congress. Uh, they didn't question, however, um, their legitimacy, just their competency. So another commentator's portrayal 
of the relationship was this. With the 96th Congress uh, scheduled to convene on January 15th, President Carter may find it easier to normalize relationships with 900 million Chinese than to establish harmonious relations on Capitol Hill. That is uh, uh, a, uh, a dour um, uh, summary of what the relationship was here between these two branches. And uh, that will conclude, that wraps up, that wraps up this uh, section for presidential congressional relations. Uh, and we will uh, wrap up here and we'll pick up with the next topic in a little bit.